Hello, good evening. Welcome to Northwest Tonight with Roger Johnson. Thanks for joining us this evening. Our top story. The fight to save the children's hospice, Zoe's place. Lady Dodd, wife of Sir Ken, is among the big names pledging some... There will be a way. I know it's a miracle they want, but uh, with, with everybody's help, <laughs> we all need to get on with it. The hospice says it has been overwhelmed with public support. Also tonight, two years after this fracking site in Lancashire was abandoned, the promised clear-up still hasn't been completed. The Duchess of York launches a campaign for a new breast cancer imaging centre in Manchester after being diagnosed last year. Please, please be careful, Matt. High stakes. The young couple tackling some of the lake's toughest climbs without ropes or helmet. And the majority of us seeing rather gloomy skies today, but something a little brighter and chillier forecast for tomorrow. I'll have a full live forecast at the end of the programme. Well, Zoe's Place, the Liverpool-based children's hospice, says that it has been inundated with offers of help after we reported its imminent closure on this programme last night. One of those to come forward is Lady Anne Dodd, wife of the late Sir Ken, who called us after last night's programme. But Zoe's Place said tonight that, despite the astonishing response, the chances of finding a new home are slim. As Katie Walderman reports. Offers of help have been flooding in since Zoe's Place announced they had no choice but to close, including from Lady Anne Dodd, who watched the news on Northwest Tonight's programme last night. Well, it was very upsetting. I only heard last night. I hadn't heard on the Monday. So it was very upsetting. And I heard um, the Matt, the, the fundraiser, talking about it. And it was so emotional um, because, of course, it's a job they all love. They're not paid a fortune to do it. It's one of those jobs. It's love they're giving, it's themselves they're giving, and just desperately sad. And you got in touch today with us, didn't you, saying that you wanted to be able to help? Yes, um, my Kendall Charitable Foundation, we're in a position to help, but I need to talk to them and talk to everybody else uh, helping with this. You know, the MP, Ian Byrne, I know is having a meeting tomorrow um, with, the, uh, with the trustees, so I'm offering my help. But it's not just about money. Planning permission for the new children's hospice has taken longer than expected to approve. And since then, the cost of creating a new purpose-built home has spiralled by millions of pounds. And with just nine months left on the lease here, time has also now run out to build it. And bosses say it would take a miracle to find a suitable new home. Right now, our priority has to be about looking at whether there is an alternative premises that can be made, made available to us. Um, all the money in the world is, is is no use to us unless we have a property that we can we can spend that on. So so right now our priority is absolutely trying to identify something that we um, could use um, for our long term future that is available right now and is, is fit for purpose. There's currently no option to stay put. The owners, the Institute of Our Lady of Mercy, have already extended the lease, but want to press ahead with the site sale. Liverpool City Council has vowed to support Zoe's place practically, but not financially. I know that the NHS have been working with Zoe's place over the past 24 hours. We're waiting for the feedback from the NHS about what practical we can do to try to support. And equally, Ian Byrne, as the local MP, has been really sort of active Tomorrow, the charity will meet with the local MP, but Lady Anne has faith a solution can be found. There will be a way. I know it's a miracle they want, but uh, with everybody's help, we all need to get on with it. Yeah. Katie Wilderman, BBC Northwest Tonight, Liverpool. As Katie mentioned in her report, the site of the hospice is owned by the Institute of Our Lady of Mercy and the sisters who also live there. They've been in touch with a statement to us in the past few minutes. The sisters say that because of the reduction in the number of nuns, they themselves can't afford to stay and that they informed Zoe's Place of their intention to sell the site in 2021. The sisters go on to add that they extended the lease and allowed the hospice two years without paying any rent to help their fundraising for a new centre. But the sisters say that they understand the pain and the upheaval but unfortunately, they cannot postpone the sale any longer. We will, of course, keep you posted on any more developments. 
Next tonight, the inquiry into Lucy Letby's baby murders has heard that she was distressed when doctors referred to her as the angel of death after she was removed from caring for newborns. The Thirlwall inquiry is examining how Letby was able to attack infants at the Countess of Chester Hospital in 2015 and 2016. Andy Gill's been at the inquiry at Liverpool Town Hall today, joins us now live from there. So Andy, first of all, tell us how Lucy Letby came to make these remarks. Well, Roger Letby was moved from clinical to clerical duties in July 2016 because consultants told the managers they feared that she was harming babies. But in 2017, managers told the consultants to draw a line uh, under the issue because two reviews uh, had shown apparently that nobody was harming babies. There was a meeting in January 2017 uh, which the head of urgent care nursing, Karen Reese, read out a statement by Lucy Letby to the consultants. And in that statement, Lucy Letby said to the consultants, members of your team have been heard to publicly make comments such as angel of death, murderer on the unit and cold and calculated. Letby went on, I have exceeded expectations in my new role and remained in work. The reason for remaining in work being that I am completely innocent of all the verbal allegations made against me. A doctor told the inquiry here today that he thought that this statement was completely inappropriate and he described it as a melodramatic dissertation. Andy, the inquiry also heard today that Letby exchanged hundreds of text messages with a hospital manager after she'd been taken off nursing duty. So just tell us a bit more about that. Yes, this was evidence from Catherine de Beja, who was Letby's occupational health manager while she was on the uh, clerical, not clinical duties. They exchanged 750 texts in 15 months. And Ms. de Beja said that the trust had given her the job of supporting Letby during a very distressing situation. The messages need to be needed to cover ordinary things like shopping and cooking to keep Letby grounded. In July 2017, Lu Lucy Letby asked for an occupational health meeting on the anniversary of the death of one of the babies she was later convicted of murdering and she said she wanted that meeting because she was distressed. The inquiry continues here tomorrow. Andy, thank you very much. Andy Gill there. Now, Farmer's Field near Blackpool, I'm sure you know, was the birthplace and it turns out the, the uh, graveyard as well of Britain's fracking industry two years ago after a number of earth tremors in the area and huge protests. The government effectively banned the process. However, two years on, the promised clean-up and restoration of the site on Preston New Road still hasn't been completed and local people are growing concerned, as Yunus Muller explains. Energy firm Quadrill is site at Little Plumpton, where the plan was to extract shale gas. Once that idea was consigned to history, the land needed to be returned to how it once looked. The work has started, but will it be completed? And this eyesore has also attracted fly tipping. Residents and campaigners are frustrated by what they've seen. It's really disappointing because Quadrilla set the timescales, they agreed the timescales, they asked for an extension, they said they could meet those timescales, and then there's just no evidence of them doing anything. Protesters fought a long campaign to get the government to ban the process known as fracking and they succeeded after concerns following earth tremors recorded close to the site before the ban in 2019. The List Trust government lifted that briefly but last year Quadrilla was told to cap the wells by the end of the year and return the land to agricultural use in the summer of 2025. The Lancashire County Council will only say it is concerned about Quadrilla's ability to meet the timetable for this site and that's why it's in discussion with the company to see what progress can be made. If they do not do as was agreed in the, in the planning conditions, then that could trigger action and that could, could trigger a breach of enforcement notice and after that an enforcement notice. And what can the enforcement notice do? Do we know? It's criminal liability. It means that Quadrilla Bollen Limited would, would be committing a, a criminal offence and be subject to fines. Cups and glasses and things rattling in here. It was horrendous, wasn't it? Yeah, it was really, really scary, yeah. Susan and Chris Holiday remember the tremors and say they will only rest until promises are kept. You know, political will changed and said, yeah, let's try fracking again, then... Yeah, the, the, the wells could, uh, the quadrilla could start again. And so until 
till it's closed down and the site's restored, we can't really get any sort of peace about it. It's always there hanging over us. Quadrilla have not replied to repeated requests for comment. Jonas Moller, BBC Northwest Tonight, Little Plumpton. Now, the Duchess of York, Sarah Ferguson, was diagnosed with breast cancer last year. It looks like she has come through the ordeal and now she is backing a new campaign for a national screening centre in Manchester. Today, she visited the breast cancer charity, Prevent, which is based in the city, where they are training breast imaging technicians. Lindsay Prosser reports. So after breast cancer, um, should, this is where I could have come to have some help. For the Duchess of York, this was a very personal visit. I'm sitting here with mastectomy and I'm, I know exactly the feeling. So I, for once I can say I do understand. Yeah. Last year, a routine mammogram found that the Duchess had breast cancer. Now she's become a patron of Prevent Breast Cancer, a charity based at the Nightingale Centre in Manchester. It specialises in research and prevention. I am really proud to be patron of the Prevent Breast Cancer uh, <laughs> org uk. Uh, I'm really proud of it today. I'm really proud they asked me, actually. Uh, I got my badge of office which is, I'm not going to take my shirt off to show you, but, uh, I, you know, I've had a mastectomy, and uh, so I know the feeling, I know the feeling of fear. <laughs> Today, the Duchess joined Coronation Street actor Sally Dinover. When the pair met on a TV programme, Sally asked the Duchess to help prevent breast cancer raise £600,000. So the charity has the £3.9 million needed to build a new breast imaging academy. It'll train more breast imaging specialists, so an extra 13,000 appointments can be offered each year. I never in a million years thought I would get breast cancer. I was given a storyline for breast cancer and um, one afternoon decided to have a little check uh, myself. And I found the tiniest lump. And if I hadn't been doing the scripts, there's no way I would have gone to a doctor. The workforce, uh, many of them are in my generation and are beginning to retire and so what we need now to do is to create a workforce for the next generation um, and so here in Manchester we're going to build a national academy for training those specialists. The Duchess of York wants to encourage women to go for their routine mammograms and to seek help as soon as they find a lump. So don't sit at the end of the bed, go and do it. Because whatever the outcome, there is a solution. Lindsay Prosser at BBC Northwest tonight, Manchester. Yeah, really good cause. We wish them all the very best. Now, we all know that Merseyside has produced more than its fair share of public figures. Well, now a series of museum tours called Inspirational Black Scousers is on at the Museum of Liverpool. It's all part of the city's Black History Month and BBC Merseyside's breakfast presenter, Kevin Duala, has been for a look round. Growing up here on Merseyside, how could I not love that view? The Liver Building, part of the Three Graces and the most recent addition to the waterfront is... The Museum of Liverpool, where inspirational Black Scousers are being celebrated as part of Black History Month. Let's have a look inside. There's so many different stories here. This is an opportunity to shine the spotlight on the Liverpool Black community. We do tours all the time through the museum for all different communities. This month, October, Black History Month, we shine a spotlight on the black community and it's a wonderful opportunity to share those stories of inspirational black scousers. Oh, wow. Wow, I, I said earlier about taking me back in time. We always think about people who inspire us. We always want to be like them. And I can always remember standing in front of the mirror. I mean, lots of kids probably did it. I want to be John Conte. That's it, <laughs> you know. that's it. The World Light Heavyweight Championship. Yeah. Inspiring. He, he was a wonderful boxer yeah. and world champion. There's a chap in front of us here. This is Dick Benson. And Dick was a carter going back. Not just a carter, but he trained others how to be a carter. He was the go-to guy to learn the trade. He faced challenges, discrimination as a member of the black community, but he was respected and loved by many because he taught them the ways of the cart. Right, where to next? We're going to go upstairs to the Wondrous Place Gallery. OK, lead the way. This way. Okay, Kev, so we're in the Wondrous Place Gallery now. Mm -hmm. 
and in front of us is a particular display where we celebrate the black community. There's so many inspirational Black Scousers on this display. With the real thing, yeah. this month, Black History Month, the city of Liverpool are celebrating the real thing by making them a citizen of honour. So now you got the best of me, come on and take the rest of me away. It's so touching for me because I'm from Toxteth. You know, and, and my dad would have would have knocked around yeah. with, with the lads from the real thing the, and that. The, it's, it brings so much pride to yeah. people, this display. Yeah. It's lovely. You know, they say every day is a school day and I've learned so much today. And if you'd like to go around the tour of the inspirational Black Scousers tour, then you can do it on available dates right through October up until the 23rd. And I promise you, you will not be disappointed. <laughs> That was Kevin Duala reporting. Second time we've had the real thing on. I think we had him on last week when they were given the... It wasn't the Freedom of the City, wasn't it? But they were, they were given that uh, honour in uh, St George's Hall. Right, let's uh, talk now about uh, another something rather iconic in Manchester this time. Because for 15 years, as you know, in the 80s and 90s, a former warehouse on Whitworth Street in Manchester City Centre was pretty much the centre of the UK's pop culture, the legendary Hacienda nightclub. Closed its doors in 97, of course. However, its mad Chester legacy lives on, and tonight the great and the good of the music scene are gathering in the city to talk about that legacy as a new book charting the Hacienda's history is launched. Katie Barnfield's got more for us. <laughs> Well, tonight is the launch of the official account of the iconic Manchester venue. You can see just behind me there are some pictures uh, of the Hacienda if you never got a chance to go yourself. Of course, it became famous worldwide during the Manchester years of the late 80s and early 90s, and the book is told through accounts of musicians who went there, fashion designers, and, of course, the clubbers themselves. It was written by Becky Hook, who joins me now, and, of course, uh, along with her husband, Peter Hook, who is famous from New Order, of course, and others. Uh, so, Becky, just tell me a bit more about what people can expect from the book and why you decided to write it now so basically it's a story a book about the clubbers mm -hmm. it's usually you hear about the hacienda and you hear about all the people that um, own the hacienda who design the hacienda but this is basically about the people that went to the hacienda so it's it's basically about us for a change <laughs> <laughs> brilliant so peter you're obviously one of the very famous contributors to the book <laughs> along with others noel gallagher bears all of that i mean what kind of memories were you sharing in it oh well my <laughs> memories were a little colored by what i went through on the sharp end mm -hmm. becky quite rightly always said to me ever since i started the book when we first met in the 90s that the thing we should be celebrating is the good bits and not the bad bits so she's gone ahead and you've done it all haven't you darling you've pulled loads of people together but i've just walked down the street and seen so many people from the old days i was like oh my god unbelievable so you but want to this, be a trip down memory lane for well people. yeah but and, and it's also one of the wonderful things today was a great friend of ours that lives very close to us phoned us and said oh that's my picture on page five <laughs> now we didn't even know him then but you know that's what it's done becky's managed to get people who wouldn't normally do things for a book to do them because it is about their early days their clubbing days and clubbing is still very very important to everybody so she's done a fantastic job i'm very proud well the hacienda threads is out tomorrow thank you Older. Katie Barnfield there with uh, Becky and Peter Hook. Should be a good night, shouldn't it? Uh, hopefully a good night too for Manchester City's women. They're playing in the Champions League for the first time in three seasons. European champions Barcelona are the visitors tonight at the Joy Stadium. It's the City Academy Stadium, isn't it? But it's got a great name now. Will there be any joy there tonight though, Richard? There might be, Roger, but it's going to be extremely difficult. Doesn't come much bigger, does it, than uh, Barcelona for Manchester City, as you say. They've been out of the Champions League for a few seasons. Barca, not only are they holders, but they've won this trophy for the last two seasons. Really feels like a big game tonight. The Joy Stadium, as you say, is sold out. And City's head coach is well aware just how difficult it's going to be tonight. Barcelona have shown at any time that they can really take teams apart. They were 1-0 down at the weekend. Um, and go and score eight in the second half, scored ten previously. So we know they've got the ability to do that. But always when I talk about the opposition, I like to quickly switch it to us in what we're capable of doing. And that's, that's going to be the focus. Well, let's get a flavour of what the fans are thinking. Delighted to say I'm joined by uh, Sharon and Tom, uh, mum and son. Great yeah. to see you guys. Hi. Sharon, 
To you, first of all, we know how good Barcelona are, but do you believe if City get it right tonight, they can win? Um, definitely, I think so. You know, Gareth's got his team now, and this is this is how he wants to play. And what we've seen, we were so close last year. Really unfortunate going out to Real Madrid in the opening in the opening stages. And I do think if we can play the way that we do play, we've got absolutely. You know, we beat them last time. I know it was a different team back then, um, but we beat them last time we played them here. So there's no reason why we can't. Yeah, a few years ago, as, as you yeah. say. What does it mean to you, Tom, as a young fan, that you know, big Champions League nights in the Champions League proper are back here against the very best opposition uh, I think it's really good it sh like we can grow from it we can learn from it if we make mistakes we make mistakes we can learn from it but just like do our best really yeah it's, it's gonna be a great occasion what do you think about Barcelona in, in general they've raised the bar haven't they Sharon how, how important is that for women's football because everybody's got to try and follow them absolutely it's amazing the crowds they get in Spain are unbelievable and it just shows you know um, that if they if they can do it, why can't we? You know, why can't we be the the torch holders for England um, in the Champions League and go on and win that trophy? Yeah, absolutely. Just a quick word on Kira Walsh. Of course, she was a great favourite here. <laughs> She's back for the first time playing for Barca. What sort of reception is she going to get? I think she'll get an amazing reception. I really hope she has a bad game, but she's an amazing footballer and she'll get the reception she deserves because she was she was she was loved here. Yeah, she yeah. really was, and she's a great player. Sharon, Tom, thanks very much indeed. Enjoy the game. Thanks very much. As I mentioned, it is a sellout tonight. Kickoff uh, at the Joy Stadium. Rog is at eight o'clock. From here back to you, Rich. Thank you very much indeed. How refreshing to hear a guest say, give you a completely honest answer there. She'll get a warm welcome, but I hope she has a stinker. Brilliant, Rich. Thank you very <laughs> much indeed. Thank you. Right, uh, we've got the weather in a moment with Abby, but before that, free climbing, that's climbing without the aid of safety ropes, is not for the faint-hearted, and you shouldn't even consider it if you're not an expert, but now it is the focus of a new BBC documentary. It follows Anna Taylor and Matt Wright as they trek 100 miles across the Lake District, free climbing some of its toughest peaks. This is our home, the Lake District, and we really love it. Climbing is what we live for, the more challenging, the better. We're about to face our biggest challenge yet. I was quite lucky in that I grew up in quite an outdoorsy household. You know, my parents are into, uh, like, fell running, mountain biking, sea kayaking, all that kind of stuff. So I got introduced to that at quite an early age. Climbing is kind of like a, a natural progression on from that, I suppose. When I was a kid, for example, I used to climb up street lampposts, climb up trees, uh, balance on fences. And uh, obviously I didn't have any rock climbing near to me where I grew up and my family was too poor to take me to an indoor wall. So, you know, pretty much climb anything I could climb, really. I was just really into it. Obviously, you, you two aside, the, the other star of this programme is the scenery. And it is spectacular, yeah. isn't it? Oh, the lakes is incredible. Each area that you go into is almost like a different world it's like you kind of you know you'll go into one valley and it'll be like really rocky and really barren and uh you know a lot of grass around and, um you know that kind of scene and then you go into another valley and it'll be forested or you go up into the skyline and it'll be sometimes it'd be like really rocky and dramatic and other times it would just be like rolling hills and plateaus I don't think you've been to a lot of the places that we went to as well before. I think it was a little bit different for me having grown up there and I'd been to most of those places at least once over the years. But Ennerdale, for example, which is the most re remote valley in the Lake District, it's where a crag called Pillar Rock is. Um, and you'd never been there, had you? And that was probably one of the highlights, I think, of the entire trip. You, you say in the programme, Matt, people might say you're reckless. I think it's very easy to assume that what we do is reckless and stupid. Yeah. And the important thing to say is anyone watching this programme shouldn't go out and try and do it because there's, there's years and years of experience that leads up to doing something like this. But how dangerous is it? Whilst on the surface it might seem reckless, to me it doesn't feel very reckless because I feel quite in control. And that's a source of tension, Anna, at, p at places in the film, isn't it? Please, please be careful, Matt. Matt. Oh, Anna, please. I'm fine. I think Matt and I have a slightly different understanding of risk in that I'm probably a lot more cautious than he is. 
I am fully aware that Matt can probably pull off most of the things that he tries to do, but I was thinking that we really need to stay within our limits here and make sure that nothing bad happens. Even though occasionally we do have our, our moments where we disagree on something, we're actually a pretty good team in the sense that Matt is very optimistic and I'm a lot more cautious. And a, a lot of the time we just end up meeting in the middle. And I think that's actually, in general, allowed us to do some, some really cool stuff together over the years. Well, whatever the future holds, we wish you all the best. And uh, Anna Taylor, Thank Matt you. Wright, thanks for talking to us. Thanks so much. Thanks so much, Roger. See ya. Bye. Anna and Matt's programme is on BBC One next week, or you can watch it now or any time on BBC iPlayer. The eagle-eyed among you may have spotted that that was recorded when I was wearing a different suit and before I had a fight with a lawnmower. Um, right, let's move on to the weather. It wouldn't have been much fun on the hills today, Abby. That's why I wasn't doing that, of course, <laughs> Roger. Just simply not very nice out there today. Um, right, a couple of photos sent in. The first one actually not too bad. It was a nice start, wasn't it? But it sort of went downhill quite quickly and it was very cloudy and actually quite gloomy for much of the day. We did see quite a lot of rain, some very heavy showers. And as always, when the weather's like this, we don't really get as many weather photos. So hopefully with the forecast picking up, we get a few more over the next few days. And if you do take a nice weather photo and you'd like to send it into us here at Northwest tonight, all the details will be on the screen behind me very shortly. You can send them in to me directly on social media or you can sign up to become one of our BBC weather watchers. And those photos come straight into us here at the Weather Centre. So the forecast over the next few days is settling down. We do have a ridge of high pressure moving in, low pressure skirting east, and that's drawing in much cooler air and slightly stronger winds as well, northerly winds. So the winds will start to take the edge off temperatures a little bit over the next few days. Overnight tonight, there will be quite a lot of cloud to start. Still outbreaks of showery rain, that gradually clearing away though. So in the early hours of tomorrow morning, it will turn drier and clearer and therefore a little bit colder. I think our temperatures overnight could drop as low as four or five degrees, perhaps a little bit lower than that in one or two rural spots where we could start the day with a touch of ground frost. So a colder start to the day tomorrow. And we could start the day with a couple of isolated showers, but I think for the vast majority, it is set to be a dry day. Plenty of sunshine developing, a much nicer day, I think, for tomorrow with our temperatures reaching around 10 or 11 degrees Celsius. So it will feel colder and factor in those strengthening northerly winds. Uh, the temperatures on paper, 9 or 10 degrees, but perhaps feeling more like 6 or 7, so a cooler feel. And here's our Arctic air starting to pile in then over the next few days. It will stay chilly over the weekend, but whenever we see the sunshine, I think that will help bolster the temperatures ever so slightly. I think Friday at the moment set to be another mostly dry day. There will be some decent spells of sunshine, perhaps just an isolated shower or two, but a very similar day, I think, to, uh, to tomorrow. It just looks as though it'll get off to a very cold start after a largely dry and clear night overnight into Friday. But these will be our temperatures, 11 or 12 degrees. The wind's swinging around to a bit more of a north westerly. On to the weekend, not too far away. Saturday at the moment set to be a dry and bright start, but it will turn cloudier and we'll start to see some rain arriving Saturday afternoon. Sunday at the moment looking like the better day of the two and then our temperatures should start to creep up a little bit more into early next week, Rog. We do occasionally chunter about our weather, but at least we're not in Florida. Yes, I know. Goodness me, we'd be busy, wouldn't we? Terrifying. Um, Abby, thank you very much indeed. And thank you for watching, whatever you're doing. Have a lovely evening. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.